everybody welcome to the stack i'm alex i'm justin and on the stack we talk about a bunch of books that have come out this week kicking it off the way of x number one from marvel yes. written by Cy spurrier art by bob quinn now this book I'm, I'm trying to think how to frame this up because i feel like this isn't exactly something that we asked for but i think we've talked a bit about Nightcrawler's revelation that he was going to start a mutant religion on Krakoa. There's certainly been a lot of questions about what is morally right and wrong in this new X-Men world. And I mean, I know how he'd probably react anyway, just by default, but certainly a lot of them would come from our third Pete. So I'd be very curious to think about what he thinks about this book, because I think what is great about this book, and I really liked it quite a bit, yeah. is it is challenging a lot of those questions that fans have been asking all along about, yes, you created this new society. Is this okay, though? Well, yeah. And what I, uh, this book just does such a great job of touching on so many little bits and pieces that were laid out in all these different X Men books and, and brings them together and like, makes them gives them meaning in a way that i feel like hasn't been done um in the series so far like uh, hickman's great and like i think like this whole world is super exciting but because it's so big i feel like we've only touched on little bits and pieces like um ten of swords x of swords um i feel like that got into this whole other weird place when we thought it was going to be the first big like exploration of what this world was and instead it was just like another expansion of the universe this book actually gets into the shit that's been on the table and it's super exciting the way that it's explored here yeah i there's a lot of things that i really liked here a lot of different sequences but just to get into spoilers one of the things that i think was very hard to read but so true in terms of the way it was written was the sequence where pixie is talking to some of the younger x-men and they're saying, oh, man, have you died yet? Have you come back? Come on, you got to try it. It's so cool. And she gives into this peer pressure. And it's so sad to watch, yeah. but feels very authentic to the teen experience. Uh, and, you know, this is something we were talking about on the live show a little bit, that superhero comics work best at the level of metaphor. And that's exactly what they're going for here in exactly the right way. It's to spur on Nightcrawler's journey uh, literal like emotional and mental journey that he's going on through this book um but uh, just on the basis of what it means for pixie a relatively minor x-men character i thought it was very impressively done yeah and and that's just one of the like we get a bunch of great magneto stuff in this uh issue um professor x feels they're still they're upping this like menace uh, aura around him in a good way the way they touch on the resurrection uh, thing, the way that new mutants are brought or depowered mutants are brought into Krakoa is, it's just a, a very well thought out book. The details are super smart and just, there's so many doors here ready to open if as this book goes forward. I was really impressed with this. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the last thing I'll say, and then we can move on. I think the fact that they are publishing a book like this, when just a couple of years ago, even though we had some good ones, that it was all X-Men fighting other mutants and bad people who want to kill mutants. And that's what it's been for a long time. And now we get a book where Nightcrawler is questioning the morality of the X-Men. And that is the point. That's yeah. very cool. I like yeah. that a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, so good stuff. Moving on to the opposite end of the spectrum, potentially. Batman Fortnite, zero point number one from DC Comics Concept by Donald Mustard, which sounds a little made up to me, honestly. Written by Christos <laughs> Gage and art by Riley Brown. I'll tell you what, this is a great creative team here. Christos Gage is great. Riley Brown is awesome on art. Yeah. I didn't know what to expect in here, and I don't think it delivered necessarily what I expected, but... I was surprised that I really enjoyed the story. I thought this was a fun one. Well, I, they did a great job of being like, no, we didn't have to create some weird, like, alien species that's doing Fortnite for some reason. It was just like, no, no, Batman goes to Fortnite. That's it. <laughs> There's no screwing around. And I thought that was such a smart way of handling something like this. Uh, the Riley Brown art is so good. Like, we've been fans of his forever. It's great to see. He brings such 
clean lines uh, to his work, and it works really well uh, in the Fortnite side of things. And the way that that Christos writes Batman is is great. Like the fact that he can't talk, that he doesn't really understand who he is, but he still has the signature voice, detective voice in his head. Like I thought this was well. I also, was the un- emotional underpinning of pinning it to Batman and Catwoman is very smart as well. This is yeah. a like we were saying. This is a smart creative team. They know what they're doing. It could have been a garbage comic that could have been thrown away, and it's definitely not. So very surprised and if you have any interest in this weird crossover definitely check it out next up one of my favorite books of the week the many deaths of layla star number one from boom studios yes. written by ram v art by felipe andrade in this book death finds out she's fired because a baby has been born that is going to bring immortality to the world she gives it up invades a recently dead body uh, and we follow her from there that's about halfway through the book but i really always like felipe andrade's art uh, very yeah. well done here this is a interesting very different mythology than we usually focus on in comics and ram v is just on fire lately so it's good to see him doing an original property as well as the company stuff Ram V in the stack is on fire. I hate to tell you, Alex, three books. but three, three books. books in the in this very stack. Like yeah. I feel like we've talked about a lot of writers sort of coming into their own lately. Uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson, we talked about a lot, um, and Ram V is sort of I feel like it also has that mantle right now. Yeah. Um, and this book is great. Like it's a it's a fun. It's funny while also getting into like stuff that I think is real life and death uh, here, but taken with that sort of gods who've seen it all uh, way. Uh, but in that way, they're also very petty and dealing with small um, perceived injustices. And it's just a great mix. And the art is truly beautiful. Next up, Ha Ha, number four from Image Comics. Ha ha! It's by Ha Ha! Ha Ha! Number four from Image Comics. Written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Patrick Horvath. In this issue of this clown anthology, a birthday party clown shrinks and gets sucked into a balloon. And meanwhile, a boy is trying to figure out whether he can connect with his grandfather. I'll I'll tell you what, this, and I, I don't mean this necessarily in a bad way, this is the issue that felt the closest to Ice Cream Man to me, okay. just on a horror weirdness level. Uh, but I still enjoyed it, and I think... What W. Maxwell Prince is doing here is holding back on the horror a little bit and injecting it with a little bit more emotion in this book, and and I like that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It felt, especially the stuff inside the balloon, Mm -hmm. uh, definitely felt very uh, Ice Cream Man. But I thought there was going to be a turn at the end where it's going to be like taking away, pulling the rug on the fantastical elements and the, the clown main character had died or something um and was these were the last thoughts of a dying clown um so i'm glad it wasn't that i'm glad that it just stayed in this sort of fun world and all of uh, prince's books are like little dreams and i think ice cream man are the nightmares and this this is the dream side where you're really following dream logic and having like strong emotional beats from these characters that we just hit hit on and meet in these standalone issues and then don't ever see again. And he's just such a master at giving us these stories, like an O. Henry uh, version, uh, like the own Henry of comics, you could say. I love it. Uh, next up, the mighty shout Valk- out to my seventh grade English teacher for really <laughs> oh, I thought you were say, shout out to O Henry. Shout out to O Henry, bringing that heat. You can shout turn my screw anytime. Yeah, getting that uh, current Owl Creek Bridge gang hype, hype. <laughs> <laughs> the mighty Valkyries, number one from Marvel, written by Jason Aaron and Torin Grunbach, art by Matea uh, De Lulis and Erica De Urso. In this book, we're getting two stories of the Valkyries. Front is. Jane Foster, and the backup story is, well, she gets a name by the end, but it is the Valkyrie that we know from the MCU, from the Marvel movies who recently showed up in main continuity. Uh, This is great. Uh, They keep rebooting this book, but I enjoy every version of it. Yeah, I I sort of don't like that they keep rebooting it because I just want to follow the the Jane Foster Valkyrie story. I think the character's really good. The, The powers that Valkyrie has are uh, really interesting and the positioning her as this like uh steward of the dead 
uh, literally where she like can see people who are close to death, how close to death they are, is really interesting. So I want to see more of those stories. The fact that it's paired with um, the Valkyrie from the MCU and sort of paying, like owning, not owning up, but like paying homage to that storyline and really bringing it to the, the comic universe is great. It's really well done here. I The story was very sort of weird in space and uh, getting into some stuff that I didn't see coming. So I like this book. Me too. Next up, Nightwing number 79 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Bruno Redondo. This is Nightwing dealing with the revelation from the last issue, the, I guess, kind of first issue, at least, of this reboot arc, that Nightwing is now rich. He got a bunch of money from Alfred. He's trying to decide what to do with it. In Bloodhaven, he's hanging out with Barbara Gordon. I'll tell you what, the Nightwing, the, the Nightwing Barbara stuff, so romantic like the way that it is paced in the paddles just hit me right in my heart the entire time i want so bad for their relationship to start back up yeah and it feels like well, how much have we actually seen them being together like i feel like it's never happening like let us have it. give us this give it to us let them be and on the other end of the spectrum, Bruno Redondo's art is stunning throughout this yeah. book. The layouts, the way that he draws Nightwing, it's great. I We talked about the last issue, how blown away we were by it. And same thing here. This is, I've never been truly into Nightwing. There's been runs that I really liked. The Tom King, Tim Seeley stuff that they did with Spiral was super fun. Yeah. But I think that was the most, honestly, that I've been in Nightwing as a solo title and this is fast on its way to being one of my favorite runs ever, even though it's, we're two issues in. It's so good. In this issue, I was like, oh, Nightwing's the Spider-Man of the DC Universe, especially in this run. And I mean that as a compliment, both visually and the way the character is so earnest, but funny. And you're really pulling for him to, to just keep going. Definitely check this out. Well, let's move to another Spider-Man-esque character, Radiant Black, number three, from Image Comics, written by Kyle Higgins, art by Macero Acosta. This is a hero who has some new powers, somewhat indefined. He touched a black hole, and now he can fly, and he has some super strength and other things. We're not quite sure exactly what. But at the same time, he's a frustrated author, and he's trying to work on his writing while living once again with his dad, in this issue, there's a really interesting structure here where he's trying to figure out how to break a short story while trying to figure out also what his new life means as a hero. Uh, this title is really good, and I've been very surprised by it every single issue. Yeah, and I agree. I think this issue really felt like sort of a concept issue, like breaking the story while breaking down the new identity as a superhero. I thought it was a fun way of telling the story and uh, we're watching the invincible uh, series on amazon um and this feels like uh, uh, spider-man-esque yes but also just the way the art uh, yeah. and the character feels so invincible to me and it's really fun to feel like you're at the beginning of a story like invincible that had that much depth and breadth throughout the run yeah, and the thing that separates it, and this is such a small thing, but I do think it's important, is this is a character who is older than Mark Grayson. Mark was yeah. a teen. It does have those notes of it, but this is somebody who, if Mark got his powers 15 years later, what would that be like in a certain way? Yeah, this feels like, I guess, like Mark Grayson in the college years a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like the big beginning of invincible he's like just a dumb can that gets kicked down the street first like <laughs> so many issues and in this he's a little he's like a little bit beaten down by the world in a way and then trying to this is like a re-emergence uh, i guess is the way to say absolutely it. next invincible up is a it, can that gets kicked down the street is what i'm saying i really like that metaphor don't don't make fun of it. It was great. Alien number two from Marvel Comics, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Salvador La Roca. In this issue, we are picking up on the first one, obviously, where a <laughs> <laughs> ex-Marine who is in charge of his xenomorph program is back on Earth. He's retired. Unfortunately, his son is part of the Wailing yutani resistance and has gotten in some big trouble on a space station. So he heads back up there to bail him out. Uh, God, this book is good. It's so scary. It's so well drawn. It is, I said this with the first one as well, but as an Alien fan, I am so happy reading this book right now. Yes, and like, there's just something about the Aliens where it's like, it's like, you can't beat them. 
they're yeah. always i don't know what it is <laughs> like even beyond like pre- everyone's like predator i'm like predator fine but there's something about the aliens that's like no they're gonna get on your face <laughs> and it's weird that they've been able to pull this trick on us because the whole thing is weird they cl- cling to your face they come out of your gut and then they're sort of like big bugs that are like they don't move much they just happen to get you yeah uh but it's there's something very scary about it. it's terrifying and it's yeah. even more terrifying here in a certain way because th- this guy knows about it. Like he lays it all out and he says, Hey, like we do, I don't even think they do this in the movies at any point, but he's like, okay, we call those face huggers and there's yeah. the eggs and they can jump on your face and they can plant the eggs in you. And then there's the Z and like, he lays it all out for everybody. And to your point, you're still like, no, they're not going to win. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to beat these face huggers. It is. It does feel a little bit like a postmodern alien story where it's like, well, yeah, everyone knows, but the fact that, that the team, that Philip Kennedy Johnson, is still able to make it scary and recapture that fear and tension while still being like, you guys all know what's happening here, is it really impressive. Yeah. And just the very idea, Justin, I would tell you, of uh, the alien and the facehugger and everything, it makes my stomach feel a little queasy. But do you know what makes my stomach feel better? What's that? Cacao oh, Bliss. Cacao Bliss, of course. Cacao Bliss. Yes, uh, this this podcast is actually brought to you by Earth Echo Foods and their superfood product, Cacao Bliss. And we have worked for weeks on practicing how to say cacao, and this is where we've landed, cacao. Uh, nothing feels better than being able to enjoy rich, smooth, creamy chocolate and knowing you are doing something good for your body. Alex, do something good for your body. It's not like the um the scrub that you're putting on to really enhance your beard growth uh, mm-hmm. this stuff's actually good for your body you know, what about the face hugger is that improving my uh, body it's a good look it's improving um mm-hmm. the outside the inside uh is trouble yes uh you know they actually they start with 100 percent organic cacao beans that are naturally kissed by the sun that is blended with oh. turmeric. Oh, wait, Alex, they said, please don't make that kiss noise. I don't know if you read that. It's written right yeah. below. Hey, we just have a couple of directives. Just uh, read the script, and whatever you do, do not do the kissy noise. Make the script seem supernatural every line. And they said, don't comment on every line, you f- stupid improvisers. <laughs> it's blended with turmeric, MCT oil, coconut, Himalayan sea salt, cinnamon, and black pepper. Uh, and uh, no fi- no face huggers, no xenomorph eggs or anything like that, which is nice. It is nice. And the result, you're going to fall in love with a truly decadent, healthy, guilt-free chocolate, removing your cravings, facilitating weight loss, boosting your energy, and reducing that inflammation, Alex, Ooh. with one simple drink. <laughs> now, by inflammation, you're talking about the alien that is slowly growing exactly. inside of me. This stuff will get that before it bursts out of your chest. Uh, drink some cacao. <laughs> Not only that, it's friendly to paleo, gluten-free, keto, vegan, and vegetarian diets. For the last eight years, Earth Echo Foods has been a leader in the superfoods market, and they are proud to have served millions of customers worldwide, including <laughs> space. <laughs> but unlike Waylon Yutani, they're a good company, and they are offering up 15% off when you use the code MINUTE15. You can check it out at earthechofoods.com slash media. So go do that. Check right it out. Now. Find your bliss, your cacao. <laughs> guaranteed to prevent face huggers. Not guaranteed. <laughs> that is not a guarantee. Stop. It says, well, again, don't do it at the end. Because <laughs> if you did it earlier, fine. But definitely don't do it at the end. Justice League number 60 from DC Comics, written by Brian Michael Bendis. And once again, Ram V, art by David Marquez and Zermonico. This is front story. We're getting a Justice League story. They're recruiting some new members. Uh, Naomi. Black Adam. And in the backstory, we're getting some Justice League Dark. Uh, I'll tell you what, I like this. I was a little iffy. I think we were all a little iffy on the first issue, mm-hmm. but I think it's starting to hit its groove, and I enjoyed it here. I think Brian Michael Bett is kind of starting to figure out the voices and making them work, and I, there's some fun bits. What, what was your take? I really like the backup, the Justice League Dark stuff, the Ram V stuff. My yeah. issue with the front half is this to me it's like what bendis does a lot where he's like hey i made this character and now they're the focus of everything that i do um and you we get that with naomi here where i'm like this isn't a justice league book you're just trying to sneak in your character <laughs> like i feel like in any other time in comic book history it'd be like make up a new character we need a new character and now the creator would do that 
and then they would just like bring it in a little bit here and there let it sit whatever but this is just like it's like naomi's the focus of everything everyone wants to talk about where naomi's from the mission is to go to where naomi's from it's like hey ease up she's new <laughs> it's a new you know it's a new person on the team they don't get to be the star right away i don't know i i since there was so little Naomi, I think the original series was six issues or something like that. I'm okay with it. I understand what you're saying, but I like the character. I know they got to lay in a little more groundwork because they're developing a CW series with Ava DuVernay. So it's all good. Do your do your IP development. I'm happy to read it. Oh, wow. That's what I love. My favorite books are the ones that I hear about that have the most IP development. Mm. I, they put the levels on the front cover now, right? Yeah, and this one is peaking. <laughs> Next up, The Old Guard, Tales Through Time, number one from Image Comics, written by Greg Rocca and Andrew Wheeler, art by Leandro Fernandez and Jacopo... Jacopo? Jacopo? Uh-oh. Cabani. Oh, I, I, you know... No, I think... I, think I shut down. <laughs> Jac- Jacopo? I believe is what you said. Yep. Close enough. This is two stories about the old guard spinning off the series. You may have seen the movie on Netflix talking about IP development, but this is great. This is both of these stories are really good. I love telling stories inside of the stories. The first one is just about an axe throughout time. Very ship of Theseus type thing going on. Okay. Uh, and the second one has your fave gay couple from the movie focused on uh, just good stuff I, I liked both of these a lot what'd you think yeah the art's fantastic throughout uh, and is has the same vibe as the original series um and it's it's nice to have a little pocket this is like a little pocket universe that's developing here um i wonder are people from the movie going back and reading the comics because um i hope i hope so Oh, you mean people who saw the movie? Yes, people who watched the movie and yeah. maybe didn't know about the comic, and maybe they're tracking back. I, don't know. I hope they did. Yeah. I think people, uh, you know, I was joking about it a little bit, but people were really into Nikki, and I'm forgetting the name of the other guy, the gay couple. So yeah. I do think they created all sorts of new fans for the property. So hopefully they're checking this out because it's a good, fun story. Next up, Eternals number four from Marvel, written by Kieran Gillen, art by Asag Ribic. In this issue, we're getting more Eternals fighting and doing stuff <laughs> i don't know how to describe it it's just very well done it, it is it's especially it's epic mythology style storytelling done with um with a it's a complex series of character interactions done with a light touch with fun dialogue there are jokes to keep it light both from like the narration the commentary on the different characters like it's it's good. It's uh, it's like a chess match a little bit. You have to really have your your head in the game to be like, oh right, that's why he, he he's doing that. That's why she's there. Um, but well, it's it's good. To your point, one of the best bits in the book is Cersei talking about the current problem of Eternals being killed off and saying, okay, I'm gonna go talk to Tony Stark. I'll you know deign to talk to this human and walks one of her compatriots through the whole conversation she's gonna have with Tony Stark, and it's clearly exactly what you would see in any other comic book but her essentially throwing a human a bone and yeah. it puts her on such a higher level than anybody else in the uh, marvel universe particularly given she's like generously considered a c or d list avenger at best to yeah. flip that dynamic is kind of stunning and amazing uh, i love it. i agree i thought that was really fun and then this fight at the end with Thanos I thought was great uh, and positioning these Eternals I won't spoil it but again pitting them against each other I thought was very cool yeah great book next up Catwoman number 30 from DC Comics written once again by Ram V art by Fernando Blanco in this issue Catwoman is continuing to investigate the underworld of Gotham City the Riddler has been attacked she's trying to figure out exactly what's going on there um, another really good rebooted comic from DC Comics uh, once again like Nightwing I was not super into the Catwoman comics but I'm really enjoying this take I agree that they, they've uh with this book really been able to focus in on like the two sides of Catwoman that I think make her really interesting outside of all the Batman relationship stuff that I feel like she's been so attached to it for the past couple of years. Like there's her like 
uh, late at night cat burglary, like mixing it up with different ba- other Batman villains, and then like bright fancy parties where she's uh, stealing or like uh, undercover as herself or another like high society person um, finding her next mark or finding a clue for to get into the mystery she's after. And I love that the sort of duality and art's very good in this. Next up, here's a comic that we probably should address a little bit of the controversy around. Mm. Ultra Mega number two from Image Comics by James Harron. Now, we reviewed the first issue of this book, and we unequivocally loved it. We gave it a rave review, put it first in the stack when it came out. The idea of the book was just big kaiju battle. It ends up in an epic way, has a huge twist at the end, where it jumps many, many years into the future, which is where we pick up an issue two, as we follow this kaiju cult and the they fight a Ultra Mega, which is their version of the uh, big, I don't even know what you call it, just like not robot defender, but like the big de- Pacific Rim style defender of uh, everybody against Kaijus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, however, after we posted that review, we became aware of some controversy online where people were talking about it uh, and felt a lot of very stringent, strong things about the book. We talked about this a bit on our Patreon Slack as well and got some people's feedback there. And uh, there were thoughts of, is this appropriation? Is uh, the fact that there are no Asian characters in here a problem? Is it sexist because all of the women die? Uh, There are a lot of other things there that I'm sure uh, certainly forgetting. But I think at least, Justin, what you and I fell on is I think all of this criticism of the first one was apt and well said and worth discussing but at least in my opinion it was worth also paying attention to what was going on in the second issue see if that stuff held up see if they're going for something different it doesn't dismiss any of the criticism of the first issue but does it change it in any way so uh, what's your take both about the controversy and how it bears up or not with this issue yeah no i i agree there it there are some some issues there like Definitely, like it feels like we're not getting um, the 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 female characters are like, oh, I see what you've done here. It's not a character that I'm like really like. Oh, this is an original idea. It feels like you're taking sort of tropes and using them in your story. Um, so I, I definitely think that could um, have an eye going forward. And I think this issue it gets out of the paradigm that the first issue uh, did. But I also think like. The issue, this comic feels like it's very much saying like, well, here's what you what a kaiju story is, and they are bad at uh, at they use tropes throughout. Like I feel like, and this book is taking is trying to be like, well, we're gonna take that and push it in these weird directions. And so the first issue definitely started in the trope world. So I think that's where the criticism is. But I do think with this issue, it does push out beyond that a little bit and get into some like weirder worlds. Um, we do get uh, some more non-male characters uh, here, or non-white like white dude characters. So I think that helps to shake it up a little bit. And um, I hope going forward it will continue on this path, because I, do, I think it's a beautifully drawn book, and the story is interesting. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And I, again, don't want to dismiss any of the criticisms. And if there are further criticisms that we missed in this issue, please, if you're listening out there, definitely let us know because we want to have a conversation about it. But I also felt like, like you're saying, I think there's something to be said for this is a stew of tropes. That is the whole idea of this book. It's not trying to be an original kaiju book or anything like that, but a jump from being a a kaiju book to being a post-apocalyptic book. It feels a little Mad Max in here at certain points. Uh, There's a little, you know, Akira going on at certain points as well. Like, it's pulling on all these different things, and I think that is okay to do. You could pull on a bunch of different things as long as it feels like it comes through and something that feels fresh or new. And I do feel like this issue feels fresh or new. I'm interested in the characters. I'm interested in the concepts. Like you said, I like the art quite a bit. It's very reminiscent of Daniel Warren Johnson and other folks like that, where there's exaggerated characters and looks, but otherwise the action is very clear and big and it often pulls back to this big screen feel at certain points. Um, So again, I feel a little hesitant to unequivocally recommend it at this point, given how strongly folks felt about the first issue. Certainly we'll back off if there's more commentary about this that we missed. Um, But I do think 
that this paid off on, like you're saying, the setup of the first issue that may have been appropriation or not, but moving forward in the second issue, it becomes clear that it's more a trope stew in my mind. Yeah. A tasty trope stew. Tasty trope stew. Good As uh, Every day, I have a little bit of trope stew, and it get, I get stronger. Yeah. <laughs> Next up, Spectre and Spectres, number three from Boombox, created and written by Bowen McCurdy and Caitlin Musto, art by Bowen McCurdy. In this issue, our Spectre and Spectres, as long as their demon, as well as their demon friend, are once again investigating another ghostly mystery. This continues to be a very charming series, in my mind. What's your take? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a fun, like... It's drawn unlike a horror book, but it's dealing with a bunch of horror stuff and horrible things happen, but the characters are pretty chill about it. So I, I do think the the art style, while I was like, oh, it's sort of weird that it's drawn this way, really starts to blend with the way that they tell the story. And, uh, and I do enjoy this book as well. Well, speaking of which, let's move on to another book that is drawn in a very cartoony way, but is definitely a horror book. Stray Dogs, number three from Image Comics, written by Tony Fleeks, art by Trish Forster. So there are a bunch of dogs who are owned by this guy. They're slowly starting to discover that maybe he murdered all of their owners and took them. This is one of the most stressful books or things, I think, that I did all week. Like, just reading this book, I was so upset in the right way at the end of this as we follow these dogs finding out more about what's going on with their owner there's a point spoiler where they try to dial 911 and the dogs have a conversation about like what do we do we don't speak english we're gonna call 911 what's gonna happen and i was freaking out reading this book i cannot believe how emotionally invested i've gotten in this this book is such a good secret book like it seems like just a goof at the when you look at the cover or whatever but then it is like the way it's drawn very like disney dogs or like it sort of pulls on like disney dog movies and then uh, other like uh animated feature films from like bluth to like the universal movies like whatever and sort of smash them all together be like no this is all your favorite childhood dog friends but they're in the most fucked up situation you can imagine <laughs> and it's it's great. It's scary. And like, it really puts you in the heads of these dogs where it's like, of course, the most horrifying thing that could happen to a dog is that they're the person they love, their their owner is killed. And then they're in the situation where they're living with the murderer and they're dogs. And they're so aware of them being dogs. And it feels like we're trapped in their dog <laughs> lives. It's It's such a good book. Yeah, it's great. I, I can't believe, again, I can't believe how into it I am and stressed out about it. I am. Uh, next up, Crimson Flower. Go hug Flower. your dog. Read this book and go hug your dog. Please. I don't have a dog, but I'm going to find a dog on the street. I'm going to hug it. I'm going to take it back to my home. I'm going to kill the owner. Maybe not in that order. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Too much? Well, hey, whose side are you on? In this? Sorry, real quick. Whose side are you on in this? Uh, the murderer. I, that's yeah. what we were talking about. <laughs> Crimson Flower, number four from Dark Horse Comics, written by Matt Kent, art by Matt Lisnowski. And this is, I believe, the final issue of this book. It's about an assassin who is very mixed up with fairy tales. We find out much more about what's going on with that as she wraps up the mystery of who killed her father, I believe. Yeah. This is very intense to read, but the art also is gorgeous, like we've talked about with previous issues. Justin, over to you. I I love this book. Like, uh, it's, it's like everyone has, like, noodle appendages in a fun way, but they're, like, murdering each other the whole time. It's hard to tell exactly what's happening sometimes. Like, I feel like this book does a good job of putting us in the mindset of the the main character where it's like, she's seeing this, both sides of this, the real world, the fantasy world. Um, and so are you. And so, like, you figure out. So we, as we're reading it, we feel like she feels. And, and the way it really seamlessly blends fairy tale logic with this horrifying story of a, a woman seeking revenge is is great. It feels like a modern fairy tale that also happens to use old fashioned fairy tale tropes to tell its story. Great. Uh, next up, one that jumps to the future, Post Americana number five from Image Comics Story and Art by Steve Scrochi. In this issue, our post apocalyptic heroes are headed to their potential salvation. It is a robot lady i think who is running basically the remains of uh, i would say disney but it's more hanna barbera or something like that yeah uh just a bunch of animatronics are hanging out this 
every issue of this book is bonkers. It's crazy, this book. <laughs> um, and it's good, though. I do like it. It's like, um, uh, it really punches you in the head a little bit um, when you're reading it. Uh, and I guess I mean that as a compliment because I do like reading it. But it is like, it's a, a trippy walk uh, through through this American world. <laughs> It's to the point that it's hard to get a grasp on what the actual reality of the book is, where you start off with an egg who is narrating things. You end with a superhero and a wolfman who are attacking them. There's a lady with a toe that spies on people. So many ideas are happening all at the same time in here, but I have a blast reading it every month, and I'm excited to see where we are headed with this wild story. Yeah, and like... It feels uh, like undiscovered country, mm -hmm. but sort of like a little like trippier. Like if you were, like if you were recording this podcast on like four twenty, that's mm -hmm. what this mm -hmm. book would be. But we're not, of course, because it's four twenty one. It's nine a.m. when we release the podcast. It's 9 we record it live. It. We record it live. Last but not least, Orphan of the Five Beasts, number two from Dark Horse Comics by James Stoko. This is your typical story of somebody trying to take down a bunch of evil people who have taken over an entire land in this one we're uh, watching our hero face thunder thighs is that what it is thunder thighs yes. thunder thighs uh it goes bonkers i know i used that word just before but again it goes bonkers by the end man i i love this book like the art is amazing the action yeah. is amazing I thought I knew where it was going, and it just went wilder halfway through, and I loved it. This feels like playing. I don't know when I was when I was young, we would rent video games from like our local. I grew up in the country. We had like a little grocery store, and they had video Nintendo games you could rent, and be like, "Oh, I'll rent this game. It's um, it's I don't know what the title is. It's uh, it's called Orphan the Five Beasts. Okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> Get home and be like, wait, what? And then like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, the gets decapitated and a tiny head comes out like oh, i thought i beat this boss and i didn't at all like this feels it took me back exactly to that moment in my life of being like uh, this is a weird game i'll play it for as long as i can and return it tomorrow and then i'll never think about it again <laughs> yeah it's great uh if that's you're looking good. for a big fight comic definitely pick that up that's a great description and folks that is it if you'd like to support our podcast patreon.com slash comic book club also we do a live show every tuesday night at 7 p.m to crowdcast and youtube itunes android spotify stitcher or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen to the show at comic book live on twitter comic book club live.com for this podcast and more until next time we'll see you at the virtual comic book show. Good night, guys. Happy 421. Come on.